Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to our panel discussion about equitable urban futures today. So I am Trisla Nelson. I'm the Director of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning. And to get us started today, I'd like to invite Dean Wentz, Libby Wentz, to come up and welcome us to um, this event. So I'll just turn it over to Libby. Well, thank you, um, everybody, for coming, and thank you, Trislin, for inviting me to say a few introductory remarks. Um, I know so many people in the room, and I'm, I'm certainly happy to see so many new faces as well, and I'm glad that you're here today to talk about equitable, equitable urban futures. Um, many of you know that I've been at ASU for 22 years. I started here in 1997. Um, as an assistant professor, and at that time, uh, the newly funded NSF CAP LTER um, was also funded. And so it kind of launched ASU, launched me as well, into thinking about cities and what it means to study cities. And to see that momentum continue throughout has been really exciting. Um, I've been in the dean's role for the last four years, and before stepping into the dean's role, I was um, taking note, um, I was working in a position with the Institute for Social Science Research, uh, that social sciences is prevalent across um, many parts of the university. There's people in engineering who are doing social science research, looking at human-computer interaction, people in the business school who are thinking about marketing strategies, psychology. Um, we have um, the downtown campus that has um, public affairs, social work. Um, new college, there's just social sciences all across the university. Now the point of this is that when I stepped into the dean's role of social sciences in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the question that struck me was, what, does the, what do the social sciences in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences bring to the table that is um, unique and informative? Um, so that we could sort of, in some ways, differentiate ourselves, but really um, of, of put down a space. As many of you know, um, ASU is not defined by these disciplinary structures, so saying, well, we have sociology, anthropology, geography, was not a satisfactory answer. But I looked at it from the perspective of what are the kinds of problems that we solve? What, are, what do people in the Hugh Down School of Communication do that work similarly to faculty in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change, or the faculty in the School of Social Transformation, or the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning? And there are four themes that seem to sort of uh, come together to help define us um, within, within the college. And the four areas were um, health, so looking at the social determinants of health, the social science components of health, not the clinical medical parts, but the, the social parts of health, um, global communities, um, e equality or inequality, um, and then methods. And what has really impressed me about where um, the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning has gone is that it aligns around all four of those areas. And this uh, particular theme on equitable urban futures also uh, strikes me as aligning with that. As you saw in your pamphlet that's all over the tables, which they're terrific, there's parts around um, you know, health related to, to bicycling and food. Uh, there's, of course, the entire theme relates to inequality. We think about cities um, across the world, and of course, the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning is very well known for um, advances in research methods. So it, to me, this is a really great example of how the social sciences at ASU um, and what the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning um, is really doing to make a, a pretty significant contribution to understanding um, city futures. So I'm thrilled to have everybody here. I'm excited to um, hear what you have to say about the, the panelists and the discussion here. And again, thank you, Trislin, for inviting me. I'm getting crazy with the. Okay. Thanks very much, Dean Wentz, uh, for that introduction. So I am, it's not every day that I wake up at 
six and feel and spring out of bed excited for my 8:30 meeting but today was one of those days because i'm really excited to be launching this new initiative for our school and also having an opportunity to talk about urban equity and to see a real diversity of people we had 100 people rsvp for this and a third of them were not from asu which i think is exactly what we were hoping that we would get a diverse group of voices in the room today so the way our our day is going to unfold is i'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to sort of what our thinking is around urban equity and what our the initiative that we're launching today is about and then we will hear from each of our panelists they will each have five minutes to talk to you and that will leave us a good half an hour to have a conversation of that's a bit more question and answer so start thinking of your questions and your comments and the important things that you want to bring to this discussion because we're really hoping to hear from you as well today so You'll see in the pamphlets that uh, Megan Martin made here um, some of the work that we're doing and also some interesting statistics around equity. And I have to thank Megan for doing a great job of putting this together, all of the promotional materials, um, or her hard work, and also Nick Ray for helping put this event together. But there's a statistic that, yes, yay, go team. There's a statistic that we often use in our school because we are urban planning and geographical sciences, and that is that the UN has indicated that by 2050, we can expect 2.5 billion more people to move to cities. So most of this, 90% of it, will probably be happening in Asia and Africa, but it's a striking number that we're gonna have this many more people in cities in really a, a short, you know, in my lifetime, this is going to happen. And I think that Arizona and Phoenix in particular are, are exemplar in thinking about urban growth because Phoenix is the second fastest growing city according to the, the census. So in, from July 2016 to July 2017, we had 24,000 more people move to this region. And if that trend continues, I think do we want to be um, splitting people into haves and haves nots or do we want to be building a city that is for everyone so i think we're in a really important place to be thinking about equity another reason is that arizona ranks really high in the inequality rankings and so if you look at what's happened since the 1970s the rich people are getting richer and the poor people are getting poorer. And this isn't a new message, but I do think that living here, you see it, you experience it, and you, you know, it certainly comes on your mind in a way that maybe wasn't on my mind as much when I was living north of the border, for example. So these, um, I think, are really, as we, you know, train students to go out into the world to, to work and to plan and to um, do a wide variety of decision making, we want them to be able to do that with an equity lens. This isn't just an Arizona problem, and I'm just, I'm putting up this, this is more um, across the United States, you can see from the 1980s till now, how the disparity in income has grown. So in the 80s, the rich and the poor were much closer together than they are now. And there's lots of different ways that this gets displayed, but the thing that really jumped out at me when I saw this in particular is how, in some ways, there have, of course, always been inequities. There are always inequities, but the speed at which inequities are increasing has really ramped up fairly recently. And so we are going to be coming up against some issues that we haven't seen before and some crises that I think we need to be prepared to face. In some ways, I think inequality is where sustainability was a few a decade ago maybe and we have the Dean of Sustainability here today and I'm so glad but I think there was a time at which we realized okay we need to be having a sustainability lens on every single decision we make this needs to be integrated into all aspects of decision making and now a lot of cities have sustainability officers and you know we're thinking about it and we're comfortable talking about it I actually think equality is the next thing that's going to rise in this way where every decision we make every plan we put in place needs to be looked at with a fairness lens and so with that in mind we're launching um, the Equitable Urban Futures Initiative. And to get this going, we're starting out with four key areas. So first of all, we are gonna start a certificate, an undergraduate certificate in Equitable Urban Futures. We are working on a new internship program where we're going to have two kind of pathways. One is that students can either be from an underrepresented minority and get funded to work on a research project, 
or we can have a, a partner or stakeholder come to us and say we have this data or this equity question that we need investigated and we will um, have students deploy to work on those questions. And we are piloting this. So if you've seen um, the Denny T. Sanford School of Family and Human Dynamics has this amazing pro program called SUPER where we're modeling the paid internship for underrepresented students from. And our first partner is the Kerr program, the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience, who's partnering with us on some urban equity focused projects for students. The second thing, the third thing that we're doing is we'll have sort of a capstone style or city studio projects where the whole course is centered around a problem associated with equity. So we just completed our first one with the city of Tempe where our students looked at mapping out what you can access in Tempe by walking, bicycling, or by transit. So what can you get to within 20 minutes? And where are the gaps? And who doesn't have access to these kinds of healthy transportation options? So we will continue along those lines. And then we also have um, some faculty and, and staff in our school, Dylan Connors involved in this, who are compiling data so that we can use it in, in many of our courses and research projects. So we're pulling together data, a lot of it in a GIS, but things on social, economic, and environmental indicators that are associated with equity. And we're deploying students in classes to, um, to analyze these data, to, to look at the problem in different ways. So how can you get involved? So we are not the uh, owners of this topic. There are a lot of people at ASU and around the region that are working on um, inequities. And so one of the first things that we would say is if you are part of an ASU school here, send us your courses that have an inequity component and we will look at including these in sort of very interdisciplinary certificates. So we don't want just our courses. We want, if your course has a strong equity focus, then send it to us. The second thing is because we do have lots of um, external partners here today, if you're interested in funding an internship or if you have a, a, some topics that would be appropriate for classes, we've already talked to, to Lisa Gold today about um, one about these school buses that are up for, oh sorry, about something top secret that's going to be fun um, around these ideas. And then, <laughs> sorry. And then also, if you have data that you would like access to, we can think of, let us know so we can think about how to incorporate in this database that we're building. Or if you want access to this data, we will find ways to share it. So that'll be forthcoming, but we're happy to sort of make that um, accessible. And so with that, you know, with the, I'll just say one last thing. So in putting this together, people keep saying, like, well, what do you mean by urban equity? And to be honest, I don't really know what we mean by urban equity. And I part, so the practical side, which is, comes from my mom who raised five kids by herself, is like, it doesn't matter so much. There's just a lot to do. And I do sort of have that feeling right now. Like there's, like just pick, pick a piece because there's so much going on. And I hope that this can just be um, the first conversation that we have about what is it and how can we solve it and um, that we can work towards that together because I don't have a good answer for you. But what I do have is six wonderful panelists here. And what I've asked them to focus their comments around today is why is urban equity important and how is their work addressing inequities? And so our first speaker came a long way to be with us this morning and we're very grateful to have him. So Mike Batty is a professor at the University College London and he's author of a book called Inventing Future Cities that came out in, the late, uh, in late 2018. He's worked for a long time on, uh, since the 1970s, on cities and complexity. And he really brings an interesting quantitative approach to trying to understand the system of the city and how to untangle some of the, um, the complexities that we see in cities. He's a member of the British Academy and the Royal Society. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike Batty. All right, thanks very much, Tristan. Um, well, I'm a, an imposter, really, because I'm only here for about five or six days, so Tristan slotted me into the program. Um, in fact, I live in central London, and uh, uh, if you want to see inequity in any particular context, go to central London. Um, I'm very fortunate because I actually have worked in a number of other places before I came to central London, 
um, and I belong to a different generation. But most of my colleagues, most of my colleagues in my center, CASA, and in the Bartlett School, which is the faculty of the built environment, uh, most of the young colleagues don't own cars, they don't own houses, they can't, because the costs of living are so great. Okay, so let me begin by saying that um, uh, in some senses, if you go back in history, uh, then there were greater inequities uh, 100, 150 years ago. Alfred Marshall, the great economist, um, in about 1900 in his Principles of Economics, defined the fact that as things got bigger, you got economies of scale. So, in other words, agglomeration economies was called. And this came onto the agenda back in the early, uh, the early 20th century. But really, people didn't do much about it because the general view about cities was that as cities got bigger, uh, they got more inequitable. And most of the 20th century, certainly in Western Europe, and here to some extent too, uh, was really uh, trying to redress these inequities, slum clearance, things of that sort. There's been a sea change, and the idea of big things being better has really come onto the agenda in the last 20 years. Uh, the idea, for example, that um, if you really want to uh, gain in income, basically, then go to a big city. Go to New York City, go to London, um, uh, you know, even go to Tokyo and so on. The biggest cities in the world do appear to be richer in some particular context. And a lot of work has actually uh, come onto the agenda, really, uh, trying to measure the, 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 the economies of scale. Uh, the group at Santa Fe, for example, uh, Jeff West and Lewis Betancourt, basically wrote quite an influential paper in PNAS, um, about 10 years or more ago, uh, which really examined the size of cities and the amount of income. And they demonstrated that as cities got bigger, um, the, per, the per capita income got greater. So if you wanted to optimize your per capita income, go and actually live and work in a big city. Of course, in some senses, what they didn't do was to actually look at the reverse side of this and to look at how big cities actually generated poorer and poorer people in this particular context. Um, they demonstrated, let me just actually show you um, uh, what they showed. Now, you can't really read this slide, um, but basically... Um, what we're showing in this slide is that um, uh, the, straight line, the straight line at the bottom, basically, and on the left-hand block, uh, basically indicates as things get bigger, um, things remain the same in some sense. But above that line, uh, where you see those red dots, for example, uh, this indicates that certain quantities uh, get more than proportionately greater. So, for example, as cities get bigger, um, incomes get, uh, uh, get higher per capita, but also crimes get higher per capita, basically, in that sense. Um, uh, and in some senses, this is what they demonstrated. Now, if you look at this in terms of other kinds of context, if you look at this in Britain, this is not the case at all. London is the great outlier, where it is quite rich in some senses, uh, but at the same time, most of the other cities are really pretty flat, basically. If you want to live in Manchester, you don't really get much more money per capita than living in a small town like Exeter or somewhere like that. So the, the critical issue is that one has to unpack this, and really what we've not done so far is to look at what happens as cities get bigger with respect to people getting poorer. It's quite clear, and that's largely because the data is not available, but it's quite clear, I think it's very plausible, that cities get bigger, um, they get richer in some senses, but also the proportion of people who are poorer in big cities gets greater in that context. And to some extent, if you just look at the total income, it kind of cancels out the poor in this particular context. So, in other words, what we're suggesting is as cities get bigger, they not only get richer in total, but they also get more inequitable in this particular context. And you can sort of see this everywhere. Now, what's not been factored in is cost of living, okay? If you then begin to factor in cost of living in some context, the whole picture about, you know, whether a big city is cool and so on, whether you want to work there to uh, optimize your income, etc., does really begin to change, etc., because the cost of living uh, in big cities tend to increase more than proportionately. Um, well, I've talked about big cities in this context. Um, in some respects, the real action is in the next uh, level of cities down. That, uh, Tristan, you looked at this notion that uh, most of the world would be urbanized uh, during this century, really by about uh, uh, 
uh, by about uh, the year 2100, I think about 95% of the, of the population is going to actually live in cities of some sort. But, and they're not going to live in big cities, uh, because to be a big city, you have to be a little city first, basically. So in fact, uh, the, the s smaller cities are increasing more than proportionately in some sense in that context. Uh, so this is a very confused picture about what the future is. Now, I've got the, uh, the orange message from the back, so I've probably got to, got to, got to actually stop at this point. But nevertheless, this whole notion about thinking about size and cities and income and inequity and so on and measuring, etc., is particularly important. It's important here to Phoenix in terms of its growing. It's important, too, to the bigger debates that are going on. If you actually look um, uh, in this context, these are, these are cities in Britain. I'm going to finish in a moment, uh, uh, Chair, but... Um, uh, this is really showing you that London is the bottom there. In some senses, the received wisdom in Britain now is that really we only have one big city, and that's London. Really, in a sense, Birmingham's only 90 miles away, Manchester's only 200 miles away uh, in that context. So there's really, I mean, that's, that's been a view about, uh, about the British urban system for a long time, and it's a view that's coincident with globalization, certainly in this particular context. Uh, the last point I'm going to make is that there are some bigger questions relating to this question of city size and equity um, and, uh, and wealth and so on. And there is to really relate to uh, basically the, uh, the disenfranchised minority, to some majority to some extent. I mean, basically the last 10, 20 years has seen the destruction of the middle classes uh, in this country, Brexit, for example, Trump here and so on. All of these things kind of are connected up to this question of uh, inequity, city size and so on. One final point. How we define the city is also important. If you want to actually blur all of this, then city, if you define the cities differently in terms of you know, where you draw the boundary, then many of these quantities begin to change. So it's quite a confused picture, and it needs a lot of sustained work. Okay. Thank you so much. Last night, I was lucky enough to have dinner with Dr. Batty, and we were talking about this morning, and that we were going to be talking about urban inequities. And I think he summed it up perfectly when he said, well, yes, there are a lot of those. And I, I thought that, anyways, I went to bed smiling about that. Um, so now we're moving from London up to Ireland <laughs> with um, Dylan Connor. So Dr. Connor is one of our recent hires to the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning. He got his PhD from UCLA, and he works on historical immigration and intergenerational mobility. And when he gave his job talk, and he was talking about how, how easy it is to go from one sort of socioeconomic economic status to another, it really resonated with this topic of inequality. So I'm happy to invite him up. Okay, thanks for that, Tristan. Um, so let me just begin by talking a little bit about why urban equity is important and why I think it's important. So what social scientists are showing is that people who live in equitable places tend to be happier, they tend to live longer, they pollute less, and they have better ideas on average. So the case that I want to make is that equity is not just moral and virtuous, it's actually a public good. And it's something that benefits most of us, if not all of us, and it's something that we should be striving for. So where does the urban and urban equity come into this? Well, what social scientists are also showing really at the frontier of research at the moment is that cities are crucial and the structure of cities are crucial to shaping how income, education, um, health and wealth are distributed among people. So we have this interesting set of feedbacks between equity and urban places in that promoting equity will improve our cities, but at the same time those same cities determine how um, equity and, and inequity is generated. So I think that that's a strong pitch for why we need a science of urban equity. So let me talk a little bit about um, what I've been working on over the last couple of years. So this is a project on tracking intergenerational mobility across the United States over the long run. And effectively what I've been doing is linking millions of individuals and families across US censuses to effectively study the evolution of the land of opportunity in the United States or the landscape of opportunity over time. Um, so the way to think about this map is we have these lighter and darker areas. And you could imagine if you had two children both born into low-income circumstances. Imagine that they're identical in every way. If you put them in a darker area on that map in the early 20th century rather than a lighter area, 
on average, as adults, they're going to earn more, they're going to achieve higher levels of education and higher levels of occupational attainment. And what's interesting about this map is that in the early 20th century, intergenerational mobility is high around cities and urban areas and places where, in places where people are moving to cities. What's really striking about this project, though, actually, is that when you fast forward in time and you look at how upward mobility is shifting with population density, a proxy for urbanization over time, what you can see is that upward mobility is higher in population dense places in the past, and you can see that positive relationship on, the, on my right hand side. But what you can see today is actually that relationship has totally reversed. So actually population dense places are bad places to be born today, or worse places to be born than they were in the past in terms of climbing the income hierarchy. What's crucial about this is that at the same time, we've seen this flipping in the urban intergenerational mobility relationship. We've also seen a whole lot of other systematic or systemic problems occur. So at the national level, intergenerational mobility has declined over the last 100 years. Interstate migration is at its lowest level since the Second World War. Income segregation in cities is rapidly intensifying. Um, and cities are becoming prohibitively expensive, as I'm sure many of you have noticed. Um, so effectively, our cities are not doing what they used to do or perhaps what they should be doing in terms of equity. And I think we need to develop a science around trying to um, address those issues and, and understand those, those systemic problems. So let me just uh, leave off by thinking about um, what we need to do to create a, um, a science or take a scientific approach to equitable cities. Well, a lot of us are here because we have progressive attitudes. We believe that change is possible. Um, we want to make the environment around us better. Um, we need that, but that's not enough. What we also need is a strong social science basis, and we also need to be at the frontier of leveraging cutting edge data and methodological approaches. And what really excited me about coming to Arizona State, um, being a part of this initiative and joining GSUP, is that I think we're actually one of the few places when it comes to urban equity that we're right in the middle of this, where we've got these three components of caring about change, being at the frontier of data and methods, and pushing the frontiers of social science. Thank you very much, Dr. Connor. You can see why we hired him. Very good. That was very nice. So I'm really delighted that CJ Hager is here to join us. Um, CJ is the Director of Healthy Communities for the Vitalist F Health Foundation, and she oversees um, the foundation's work on built environment, healthy eating, and active living strategies. She's worked a lot in public policy and housing, and has authored Dropped, Latino Education in Arizona's Economic Future. But the real reason that I invited CJ here today is because one, about a, I don't know, maybe a year ago, we were having a conversation about equity. And she actually sort of fueled the ideas that have in some ways led to this initiative when she said, you know, a vitalist, when we talk about equity, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to not be sure what the definition is, to not be sure what the solution is. And regardless of not knowing those things, we still need to have the conversation. So in some ways, she gave me the confidence to stand up here in front of you and say, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm really pleased that we're having this conversation. So please help me welcome CJ. So speaking of not knowing what you're talking about, here I am. Um, uh, thanks, Trisalyn. This is really, I, I didn't know much about this initiative coming into today, today and what I've heard so far is really energizing. And I have to say, when I went to planning school in the early 90s, I was a naive 23-year-old, but a lot of the things that are coming up right now in today's discussion, but also in the field, really were the reason that fueled me into wanting to be an urban planner. And that is around the right of everyone to live in a healthy place to meet their full potential. And that as a society, we're, we're, we are obligated to help create those conditions for people to thrive. So I'm just really excited about this and I can't wait to, to talk a little bit more. Um, so I'm gonna start out with a map. Oh, I have one slide and it's a map. So I, and, and I assume with this crowd, this is, this is welcome. I'm curious how many folks have seen this map before? 
All right, not as many as I would have thought. So this is um, a map of the metro area. Uh, a few years ago, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation commissioned a series of maps throughout the U.S. of large cities. And they, what they wanted to show was that health outcomes as measured by life expectancy are different based on where you live. And this is, I think a lot of us knew this intuitively, but to actually see that disparity on a map is pretty striking and having, in this case, the zip codes, which the zip code in South Phoenix, and I can't read it from here, if you live in South Phoenix in a particular zip code, your life expectancy is 71 years old. Um, if you live in uh, eastern um, Scottsdale, I think that's Ganey Ranch area, I'm told, um, your life expectancy is 85 years old. So that's a 14 year life expectancy difference, which is, and, it, and on a good day when there's not much traffic, that's like a 20 minute drive. And that's pretty striking when you see that on a map. And there's, you know, from a methodological standpoint, there's lots of things that we could poke holes in this. But the point is, where you live determines, is a large determinant of the health of, your, of you and your family and your neighbors. And this is just one way of looking at it. And this is really why Vitalist Health Foundation is in um, health, is in this particular health equity work. We look at it from a health equity lens. You can look at this through other lenses such as uh, education outcomes, pollution, um, median wage, but I think we'll also always end up with a similar picture that there are inequities based on where we call home every night. And um, so this is why uh, we uh, at Vitalist Health Foundation focus on things beyond health care. While health care is exceptionally important to our overall health, um, there are lots of things that influence us on a day-to-day -day basis that are beyond health care. And I, I was really pleased to hear the, the dean mention social determinants of health because that's what we call them. Um, we actually call them elements of a healthy community. They're things like housing, uh, access to parks, access to healthy food, good quality jobs, education, how close you feel to your neighbor, if you feel like you can trust them or not. Those are all things that go into creating a healthy person and also a healthy place. And as urban planners and folks in, in, in that sort of work, that's what you focus on. So really working on social determinants of health is really good urban planning in my opinion. So very briefly, uh, sort of a role that Vitalist sees ourselves as playing, um, as, as I mentioned, we're a foundation. And when I took the job at the foundation six years ago, my husband, who is an academic here at ASU and studies philanthropy, he said, why are you doing this? Um, philanthropy is notoriously slow, boring, and uncreative and conservative. You are going to drive yourself nuts. And I said, I think this one's a little different. And luckily, my, that, that paid off. Um, so while we do write checks, um, they aren't large checks, we do write checks, we get to do a lot of really other wonderful things that I think are akin to what an academic, uni uh, what an academic un institution can do as well. We do data analysis, we do partnering, we do collaboration, we do policy analysis, uh, we do communications. And so oftentimes we're able to say because we uh, because um, we don't answer to the taxpayers or to a uh, to a to to the stock to the stock exchange, um, we're able to say and do things that others aren't able to do and say. And so I, I feel like we're in a great role of privilege. And so going back to the conversation that Trisolin and I said had a few years ago. Um, there's a lot of things that I, that I know I don't know because of my lived experience and who I am and, and where I am right now, but I think we all need to sort of step up and have those conversations, and I'm really thrilled that um, we're starting to have that here, so thank you. Thank you very much, CJ. So next up is Dr. Sarah Miro. Um, Sarah is a, an assistant professor in 
in our school. And her teaching and research interests lie at the intersection of urban geography and planning. And I always think her of her as kind of our resilience specialist, our green infrastructure person. But she really looks at how cities can be more resilient in the face of climate change and other social and environmental hazards. And certainly, I think we have seen many examples of that in the news lately that really resonate with who suffers in these situations. And it is not the high income classes. So I'm really happy to have her here today to talk about it. All right, well, apologies for my phone going off. I don't know why it's been weirdly like switching to off of silent lately. So I don't know why that is. Um, but well, thank you, Trislin. You've sort of taken my introduction here. But yeah, so I study uh, resilience in the face of climate change, as well as sort of other rapid shocks and longer term stresses. Um, in cities, and particularly how you build that resilience while also staying or becoming sust more sustainable and more just. And I believe that equity really needs to be at the center of resilience planning, because as we've seen in sort of numerous uh, news articles, as you mentioned, as you can see a few examples here, um, as well as many studies, we see that low income and communities of color disproportionately are impacted by disasters um, and climate change. And they, uh, and they also tend to have fewer resources to recover. Moreover, disasters, whether a hurricane or a wildfire, um, often actually exacerbate inequalities. So as part of my research, I'm really studying how cities are addressing equity in their efforts to build resilience. And so drawing on social and environmental justice research um, with some colleagues, including uh, Thad Miller here at ASU, we've developed this framework right here for thinking about how you would actually incorporate equity into resilience planning. Um, and this includes sort of distributional, recognitional, um, and procedural dimensions, which I'll talk about in a second. And so we use this framework to actually examine uh, the first resilience plans that North American cities have developed as part of the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities program. Um, and what we find is there's really a lot of uh, variation in terms of how they are actually incorporating equity into what they do. Um, and so now I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by these sort of three dimensions, drawing on examples from some of my research. So the first uh, way of thinking about equity is thinking about distributional equity. And this is really the most commonly uh, in court or invoked idea of equity. And it refers to the equitable allocation of goods, opportunities, infrastructure, uh, environmental amenities, as well as disamenities. Um, and green infrastructure or nature-based solutions is one of the I would say more popular at this time strategies that cities are using um, to actually enhance resilience. And green infrastructure, uh, the reason that's becoming so popular is that because it can provide a range of different benefits or ecosystem services to communities, everything from addressing flooding uh, to, to mitigating the urban heat island effect. Um, but most of these benefits are highly localized which means that it really matters where green infrastructure actually gets cited within a city. Um, and this is going to determine who actually benefits from it. And so I've actually used spatial analysis to examine uh, the, pl the planning of green infrastructure in a number of cities, including Detroit, which you can see here, um, but also Manila, New York City, um, and just starting on a project in, here in Phoenix. Um, and what I've generally found is that while cities are promoting green infrastructure, on the basis that it's going to provide these multiple benefits, uh, they're often not sort of strategically planning it um, in the areas where it's needed most, right? Um, and so this is uh, potentially a sort of an equity problem. And to further complicate problems, even if you would implement green infrastructure in the most vulnerable areas, there are concerns that it would actually lead uh, to what's now called sort of green gentrification um, and actually end up sort of pricing out the residents that it's designed to help. Um, and so the uh, second type of equity is recognitional equity. And this is about acknowledging historical injustices and group differences and intersectionalities that ultimately uh, continue to shape patterns of vulnerability today. And so cities have actually often not done a very good job 
of recognizing these issues, but I think one exception actually is Boston's uh, resilience plan, which you can see here, which actually uses an equity lens throughout the plan um, and particularly recognizes, for instance, systemic racism and the impacts of this, uh, as well as actually mapping out specific vulnerable populations across the city. Um, so I think this is, a, this is an interesting example. And while Boston's recognition of racial injustices in its resilience plan is impressive, um, that doesn't actually tell us that much about who is participating and who has power in the planning process. Um, so, and this is really what's at the heart or the idea of procedural equity. And so in another project, um, I'm working to examine flood resilience planning in Boston, as well as three other coastal cities. And what we're doing is we're applying social uh, network analysis to actually examine the governance networks around flood planning. Um, but also it's important to recognize that these different components or dimensions of equity are connected. And so we're actually uh, looking at the relationship between the governance networks and those characteristics and the spatial distribution of all of the policies in the city's many different plans. And so in the case of Boston, this means uh, actually scoring and mapping over 270 policies which we've uh, identified in over 20 plans. So in conclusion, while cities worldwide are increasingly focused on enhancing resilience, I think we really do need to better understand who benefits from these efforts and why they do. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Next up, we have Dr. Patricia Solis, who's the executive director of a really exciting project happening here at ASU, the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience. She um, comes to us most recently from Texas, and she also is the director of Youth Mappers, which is a consortium of more than 143 universities and 41 countries that use open spatial data for humanitarian efforts. And when I mentioned in a faculty meeting or something that we were starting this initiative, um, Patricia was the first person at my office saying, this is exciting and this is what we need. And so I'm really excited to be partnering with her on an internship program um, and to have her here today. Oh. It's such a privilege to be here. And thank you so much, Trislin, for asking um, the question, why is equity important and how? is equity important in our work? And I'm just very excited to be able to share that answer to that question with you um, in terms of my own work. But my own work is always situated with a lot of uh, collaborations. And so uh, from the outset, I'd like to take, uh, share the responsibility for all of these good ideas and take responsibility for the ones that still have yet to be developed with some faults here. Um, but I, I think our panelists have really very well articulated the answer to that first question on why. Um, and so I'll focus a little bit on the how. And um, I, th I think it's really important, especially Sarah, talking about the, the world today is changing so fast and our ability to respond to it really needs to keep up with this. And if we're already out of balance with these inequitable cities that we are working from to start with, I don't know how we're going to get there. Um, and that not only has effect on, through the environmental threats, but also economic shocks, um, social disruption, and what you might think of as slow-moving disasters that have been with us in our communities in, for so many years. So um, at the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience, uh, we like to think about the how. And uh, the how really, I, I, if I could sum it up in one word, has to do with social cohesion and listening to the voices within our communities that are experiencing resilience, experiencing these futures very differently. Um, how do we as scientists and practitioners actually engage with the questions? How do we find those questions? How do we go about answering those questions? Is just as important as which are those questions that we are asking. So um, I'm not going to go into each of these uh, priority topics. I did want to share them with you today that, that we're looking at this year and into next year. Uh, through the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience having to do with, with heat. Uh, that's one of those slow moving disasters in our urban environment. The economic resilience of a changing population growing uh, very quickly and also older, um, but also the place that we have for uh, our youth 
in our society in, in particular places. So I would like to talk about that how through the lens of these pr kinds of projects that were those priorities that we're working on. One of the how ways that we decide on some of the important questions is, is definitely through engagement with our community. Um, we are a part of a, a utility assistance network of 80 organizations that look at how to um, provide economic support to people who are suffering from the heat in the summer here. It's very hot in this part of the world. And um, some people cannot pay their bills and can pay the electricity and, and have just air conditioning. And this group of 80 community organizations here in the metro area meet regularly to try to solve these problems. Um, for the first time, we were able to get their data on, you can see in the, the blue dots, it's a pretty rough map, is a, a depiction of who has received utility assistance in the last two years. This is the first time that those 80 organizations have seen their data all together. What we found was we overlaid that with the data from the county, thank you to the county for being a part of those conversations, on um, indoor heat-related deaths. And we found that there is a gap in Mesa that there t tend to be people not asking for help, but there are a lot of these indoor heat deaths popping up in the map. So we were able to liberate the data and work with them to help understand what is going on. Where this is ongoing work that we're going to be investigating this summer about, like what is what is happening there in Mesa. But that process is what is important: unifying and and working with the communities and 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 through their questions. Um, and you know, digging down and and looking at not only their data but unifying that with um, other sources, official sources of data like the census. Um, I think we have to be very vigilant that our census maintains its quality and that we can continue to use this and have an equitable census. Uh, this is extremely important. We rely on that data. And you can see in some of these areas that I just mentioned, the, the median age is 75 in this particular block group, and the, the percentage of female population is 56. So heavily female, that's heavily female, very elderly, and some really interesting things you see the age pyramid in there going on. So we're working through some of the details of this. If you have students who would like to work with us this summer on it, we do have an open call for students. Um, and, and if they can't pay their bills, um, sometimes they lose their homes. This is one of the key um, sort of early warning indicators of homelessness. And this past summer, we learned from our friends at United Way that in the metro area, um, there was a 70% increase in elderly homeless above age 65, 68, excuse me, I think it's 68, 70% increase spike in our city. And we learned that from the United Way because we have a, a, a special event that we call the Hunch Lunch, where um, instead of scientists speaking to people like we are doing today, we also have, well, we actually have community members like we also have here today talking about what are their hunches about what's going on, sort of a safe space of not talking about hypotheses, but insights, what's coming com from the community. We're having that next week, and so we'd love to have you join us if you would like to do that. Another piece about the how. But this, this data actually is, is very um, discouraging to look at who is experiencing this in a different way. In our own community, this is Maricopa County data, the general population you can see on the far side there in terms of uh, white population being represented in blue, uh, the black population in purple, and uh, Hispanic Latinx in uh, green. And the first one shows you the general population. In an equitable world, you might see uh, the people experiencing deep poverty to be at the same rates, or people experiencing homeless to be at the same rates. And that's absolutely not the case. And um, understanding why is really important. And this data is something that one of our fellows are working on from the United Way. Another thing about how is to think about our place in the world and engaging young people. That's a big priority for us. And um, Tristan mentioned youth mappers. We need to think about the inequities at a large scale uh, and think about the global south. In cities that are growing the fastest are actually in this part of the world. And I would encourage everyone to think about how we can engage with partners and collaborators there and learn from that process. I learn a whole lot from our uh, Youth Mappers program, we have 145 universities, a part of that, in 41 countries. A lot of them, as you can see, are in countries where 
uh, a lot of data does not even exist to be able to understand what the inequitable issues are. So I encourage you to work with us on that. Our students are able to partner directly with other peers in the other parts of the world, and um, it's really uh, an enlightening process right now. With that map that I showed you in Mesa, we are tracing the building footprints using satellite imagery uh, through our Youth Mappers program. We had a mapathon party where we served them pizza and gave them a task. And we're also working with um, the woman in the hat there. She's a beautiful uh, young lady from Bangladesh and her colleagues in Dhaka University are mapping on our satellite imagery here so that we can help share and learn about what are the challenges in different cities around the world. The, the last how that I'd like to mention is um, an opportunity for all of you in the room that we have a fellowship program funded by the Piper Trust through the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience where we put together the people in the room listening to the voices and we're taking this seriously. We have six fellows from the university and six fellows from community organizations. In fact, some of them are here. Sarah is one. Uh, I see Matt Toro there. Shelly Morgan is here. Um, and we have some cross-cutting fellows working on some design elements. Shade is here as well. But these are the people that are really making the difference. And that's one of the things that uh, my work, I really believe in uh, bringing people together and um, listening to those voices and, and getting through some of those hard questions together. So I encourage that process as a part of this effort moving forward. And we, we will be doing this on a calendar basis. We'll, we'll release our call for 2020 later this year in the fall. Um, just wanted to show my acknowledgments page. It's really small font, but I think you might get copies of this so you can see all of the wonderful people that we work with uh, and all the, the voices that we hear. And uh, I think that really makes a difference not only in the questions that we ask, but in the way we get our answers and how those are taken up to really make a difference in the world and make it a more equitable future. Patricia, when you talked about those projects that you were working on, I simultaneously felt like clapping and crying. So thank you for the really important work that you're doing. Our last speaker today, last but not least, of course, is Kenneth Steele. He is a health policy analyst with Maricopa County Department of Public Health. He, interestingly, has a, his first degree is in advertising. And then he went on to do public health, which is actually like a wonderful combination, which I wouldn't have thought of, but so happy that he, has, he did. He has a master's in public health with a concentration in health disparities. Um, I got to know him in part because he is co-chair of the Arizona Alliance for Livable Communities, and so I think brings us at multiple lenses um, from which to look at equity. Kenneth. Thank you, Trislin, and thank you uh, to the school for having me here today to be part of the panel. Uh, as I was sitting here uh, listening to our uh, esteemed panelists, my, main, my mind is going a lot of different directions. It kind of dawned on me that I've always lived in big cities my whole life. Uh, I was born in Taipei, Taiwan, and then when I was really young, I lived in Singapore, which is both a city and a country. Uh, and then most recently, I was in Houston and Austin uh, before being here for the past six years. And I was like, oh, it's interesting. So the work that uh, I've been doing since I've been here has really been focused on urban equity. Uh, but then just from my personal experience, uh, it's really interesting to think about what's happening to big cities and the inequities that kind of manifest uh, as cities grow, especially in cities like Austin um, that aren't really huge big cities, um, but that are becoming bigger cities and a lot of displacement, um, a lot of interesting things are happening there. Um, so thanks for that uh, thought process that I just had. Um, we're about to get into some Q&A, uh, but I wanted to warm you all up a little bit. Uh, how many in the room are public health professionals? Would you consider yourself a public health professional? Then raise your hand. OK, so I see about five or six. OK, so what I'm here today uh, to do is to tell you all, or to inform you all, that actually all of you are public health professionals. Um, if I were to ask that same question, who's most responsible for the health of our community, which organizations are most responsible, then you may think, well, the health department is responsible, uh, the healthcare system is responsible, hospitals uh, are doing things. Um, 
but actually, kind of like what uh, some of the panelists have already mentioned, especially CJ, uh, health is actually really a product of our environment. Uh, it's a product of where we live, learn, work, pray, and play. Um, it's a product of the access to resources that we have in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, a lot of times health uh, equals health care, uh, but if we think about it, uh, maybe we're at the doctor's office a few hours a year, hopefully, hopefully not more than that. Um, but the rest of our time is spent uh, at work. Uh, it's spent in our homes, it's spent in our communities, on our streets. Um, so those conditions that we live in really have a big uh, contribution to our life expectancy, to our chronic disease outcomes, to our mental health, to our well-being, our happiness, um, uh, our mobility. Um, so actually all of you, in a sense, are probably a public health professional in some way. And I'm not here to like kind of claim y'all or, or, or do something weird like that, but um, just to make a point. Okay, so we've already seen the life expectancy map. We already know that there are health gaps that exist within our community. If we look at Central City, South, South Phoenix, compared to Northeast Scottsdale, there's a 14-year life expectancy gap. Um, there's also, uh, that also shows us that there are gaps in uh, prevalence of chronic disease um, and the burden of disease on healthcare costs there are gaps based on where you live. There are gaps based on the color of your skin. There are gaps based on your income. Um, and like Trislin was mentioning, um, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And it's kind of the same in terms of health. Um, the rich are getting healthier uh, due to technological advancements, due to advances in healthcare delivery um, and access to those types of things, uh, and also due to the environments that uh, rich people are living in, um, but the poor are actually remaining uh, unhealthy, or in some cases, they're getting unhealthier. Uh, so again, I see we're just kind of, I'm just trying to make a connection there. So let me give you an example a little bit uh, of some some data here uh, locally. Um, but if we look at South, uh, if we look actually, if we look nationwide, uh, Black Americans are 30% more likely to die of chronic disease, cardiovascular disease. Uh, than white Americans. And if we look at South Phoenix in particular uh, for diabetes, then uh, uh, African Americans are 3.5 times more likely to be hospitalized for diabetes in South Phoenix than their white counterparts that are living in the same zip codes. So uh, there are a lot of issues of equity uh, when it comes to health. And the reason why this inequity exists um, we need to be clear is due to laws and policies that have historically uh, contributed to or caused these inequities. Um, so that's where uh, me coming in from the Office of Public Health Policy at Maricopa County, we and our partners are really focused on laws and policies that, are, that have created or that are perpetuating uh, health inequities um, and urban equities uh, throughout our communities. Um, and so the work when you do equity work is really different than work that's just broadly focused on improving the health of the entire population. That's kind of a more universal approach. And actually, we still need to have universal approaches for many uh, health-related things. We want everyone to be vaccinated. Uh, we want everyone to be able to get medication if there's some sort of a natural disaster. Um, and there are going to be challenges with resiliency in terms of people getting access to like points of dispensing or something like that. But when we're talking about health equity, we really need to have targeted approaches. Um, so that's where um, the work that we've been doing um, with the, the AALC uh, has focused on targeted approaches, focused on law and policy that directly address health inequities or urban inequities. So a lot of the, what we do is uh, we work with a bunch of different partners um, and we uh, look at city and town general plans, county comprehensive plans, transportation plans, active transportation plans, parks and trails and recreation plans, and we work to get uh, not only health included in those plans, but also equity included in those plans. Um, so our goal is when you control F, uh, a general plan from a city, you're gonna find the word health come up 30, 40, 50, 60 times, uh, all across the elements of a general, of a general plan. Uh, circulation, housing, um, development, everything. We want health to be included in those things. But more and more in the past couple of years, as the trend is to realize how important equity is, we want to see equity in those plans as well. And so I just want to sh give a shout out to Reed from McDot, who's here, 
uh, they worked with their consultant, Jacobs Engineering, and uh, within their plan, um, they're taking uh, data uh, based on uh, socioeconomic data, health data, hospitalization data, access to vehicles, uh, ethnic minority, low income, uh, d disabled population, elderly population, young population, and then those are the areas specifically where bicycle and pedestrian improvements are going to be prioritized for the next 10, 20 years. Um, and uh, so that's really, really big work. Um, I believe one of the other panelists called that kind of like distributional equity. So they're getting the resources in the communities through a targeted approach to make sure that there's some sort of a shift. Uh, that we're lifting up these communities that are experiencing worse health outcomes. And then the only last thing I want to say is, uh, you know, contact me if you want to talk about data. We can provide health data. We need health data to be able to make better decisions, um, to make that targeted approach. But then even more so, and I hope we can talk about this more during the Q&A, we need to talk about how we can better engage communities in these types of processes. We need to change our governance structure so that they can be uh, included in the decision-making processes and then to flip, flip these uh, historical, historical laws and policies that have resulted in the inequities that we see today. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Um, I was not mistaken to be excited when I woke up this morning. That was a really great discussion or the start of a discussion. So now we'd really like to hear from you. So um, there's a microphone. Nick has it back there. Um, I think there's, Wei Li has a question or a comment. <laughs> Hi, I'm Wei Li, I'm 30% in this particular school. So I'm really excited to hear about the initiative and to learn from the six panelists and also Chesterland's uh, introduction. I actually have three questions. The first one is being an immigrant scholar myself, I cannot not think about immigration, especially here in Phoenix. And in Arizona, we are at ground zero for immigration nationwide and for the importance. So I'm just wondering uh, from the panelists, how immigration feature into your work on equitable urban, urban future? And the second question is piggyback what Patricia already said in terms of um, we ha how can we branch out to outside the US. We have in-house experts, including foreign-born faculties, Truslin himself, herself <laughs> included, and also we have a large number of international students. How are we going to tap into these resources to collaborate to do this line of work beyond the US? Last but not least, again, piggyback <laughs> with, with Patricia in terms of the importance of census, because if Spring Court uh, allow the current administration to add citizenship question to the 2020 census. I can guarantee, because I happen to know a lot about census due to my previous work, uh, the undercount will be severe, especially among immigrant population. How are we going to deal with, and this particular question, especially for Dallin, since you will be leading the local uh, data collection efforts. So how can we possibly remedy a detrimental in fact, for not having adequate, equitable, and accurate census count. How, what can we do as scholars and community members? Thank you. No pressure. <laughs> that was a lot of questions. Thank you, Wei. Um, I'll, I'll take maybe an approach towards the last one. I don't know if I'm really going to answer any questions by that. But I think um, one way that we might consider um, helping um, support uh, the, the really vast and incredible data resource with the Census Bureau is to obviously um, allow our decision makers and policy makers to know how important it is to us. I feel like that's, that's really important. Um, also, you know, this, there, this has gone so, so far that I don't really know, you know, exactly what to expect out of these decisions. Um, but I do think that no matter what happens, I think that we should um, be very supportive of our geographers in the Census Bureau. Um, the chief of the Geography Division, Deidre um, Dalpias Bishop, she is a geographer and she's uh, extremely brilliant and um, her whole team there, I think that connections with them and supporting them and communications, and they do a lot of research as well. So I think not just in times of 
uh, crisis, but also you know being very supportive and see how we can help with that. Um, and then also letting our community organizations know how important that data is because that they are the ones on the ground helping uh, and can help spread the word that it is important to answer those questions because of what it means, uh, the federal allocations of resources, and then the understandings that we get from that data. Um, I don't know if those are re good, really good solutions, but um, I, I think that those connections are really important. Yes, so thanks for that way. So, um, so I was just at the meetings of the Population Association of America in Austin, and one of the big topics was around the availability of census data and the kind of crisis that's going on there. Um, the, one of the major concerns, in addition to the um, citizenship question issue, for example, is actually a pull-in on confidentiality and small area data. So it looks like um, there's, a, there's a major effort to basically stop researchers getting access to the types of data that we need to try and study cities and particularly small area kind of inequality. Um, and there's a group at the um, Minnesota Population Center who have really been spearheading the effort to try and stop that, um, that those efforts to try and restrict data. Um, I think the sense and the tone from the meetings that we had and the discussion between the Census Bureau people and researchers was that actually we're losing the battle at the moment and that I, it's not gonna be surprising, I think, at this stage when there is a pull in on the types of data that we need to study these things. So I think actually tuning in to what the Minnesota Population Center are trying to do and suggesting to do to try and get behind um, decision makers and policy makers to try and stop this from happening, I think is absolutely crucial. Well, while you were saying that, I was thinking about the first part of your question, Wei, which is um, about the immigration uh, the community, the immigrant community. Um, this is this is just a referral. Uh, Nate Smith, who is the community outreach director of the Phoenix Rescue Mission, and they deal a lot with refugees. Uh, he is one of our fellows for the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience. We can, he was actually supposed to be here, but he had to um, decline out of town at last minute. But we can put you in touch with some of some people also who work directly with that. Sure, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Roseland. I'm the new director of the School of Community Resources and Development at the ASU downtown campus. Uh, thanks for a really great project launch. This is a, a great panel, very, very interesting, exciting. My, my question is this, when we think about inequality um, and equity at the national level, we can point to particular countries or regions of the world because we know the outcomes. We can talk about Scandinavia, for example, or we can talk about Cuba. We cannot, in my understanding, do that at the urban level. Um, and I'm wondering if any of you think that we can do that, uh, or if you have, I like the hunch lunch idea, if you have a hunch about what it would take for us to be able to talk about who's actually doing well and why um, within countries at the urban level. So I, my, my sense is, and some of the work that I presented as kind of an extension of this body, is that we're actually making great progress in trying to understand these within-country differences. I think for the, the vast majority of social science history in terms of trying to understand issues of intergenerational in, or intragenerational inequity or inequality, people were fixated on national level differences and trying to explain differences between countries. And what we've managed to be able to do over the last five to 10 years is to get access to these between city and between urban data and follow people over time to actually try to effectively generate a blueprint of what types of places are doing well in terms of equity or closing intergenerational gaps and what, kind, what types of places are not. So one of the major pushes is starting to think about actually how can we make, for example, low opportunity places, more like high opportunity places, and what would it take to do that, and is that feasible? So I, I think it's a really hot area, and I would encourage anybody who's interested in it to definitely take a look at it. Yeah, I mean, the, I think we do know, perhaps more than we credit ourselves for, about 
internal patterns, um, which really relate to long-standing notions about industrialization. So, you know, North America and uh, Western Europe have gone through this process of industrialization, then deindustrialization in that sense. And a lot of inequities really relate to that in a sense. You know, my own country in the UK, for example, um, you know, it's really dominated by the London region in some sense. And of course, um, the London region is the bit that really was not industrialized to any extent, the industrial north really. Um, all of those cities I was referring to um, are those where the greatest inequities lie really and it's still in this sense and there is substantial migration from north to south still um, the patterns are changing quite dramatically in some sense because uh, in some senses in the last 10 years or 20 certainly 20 years um, you know places like London which is fairly characteristic of you know world city etc have had new new types of um, uh, immigration in this particular context and, and inequity. And of course, m com complicating all of that is a degree of volatility that it's very difficult to know now, for example, how many people actually work in London. Because you have a, you know, if you're in a, a European, well, we are still in the European community. Last, last time I looked at my diary, we were still in the European community. But uh, <laughs> there are some, so May the 22nd, I think, is a date that uh, uh, resonates because if we, if we leave before May the 22nd, we don't have to elect a new cohort of European politicians from Britain, basically. So that's one of the things. Anyway, notwithstanding that, the, the movement of people, I don't think this is going to stop. I mean, if, when we leave the EU, um, um, I mean, before we join the EU, if you go back far enough, so there are very large numbers of French people, Italians living in London, etc. I don't think it's going to be dramatically different, basically. There is some slowdown. But this volatility, um, the ability to, to, to migrate, etc., is really quite substantial. And that's, that's complicating a lot of analysis, basically. So if you look at migration statistics from the census, for example, from the British census, um, you know, which is a 10-year uh, uh, census like your own, um, then a lot of the movement is being missed, basically, in this particular context between the two dates. Um, so I think that, that, that there are some real challenges in doing what you suggest, but we do have some, some, some take on it, I think, at this point. Lauren B. from the Global Institute of Sustainability, the Julianne Wrigley Global Institute. So I'm um, switching to the policy and governance angle, and um, I know from personal experience, I'm also the vice mayor of Tempe, though I'm not here in that role because I don't want to take vacation time. <laughs> but I'm um, switching to that aspect. I know how important it is to have elected official buy-in and a champion, but it's also important to have that buy-in at the staff level. So about five or six years ago, the university invested in a position at the city of Phoenix, a sustainability officer that later became a staffed, fully staffed office of sustainability. And a couple years ago, the Institute of Sustainability invested in the same for Tempe, a quarter of that time for that officer who was Braden Kay, one of the first graduates in the School of Sustainability PhD program. He quickly, in his very first year, flipped around. He got three times the funding that his position, that his position brought in. So he really made the case to the council, to the, uh, to the city, to the you know, organization that his, his position was valuable. And now in our current budget year, we are probably going to be funding a resilience officer, an office of resilience. So it's had so this compounding effect by a little bit of, it was like $25,000 a year, the university was able to really affect it was a cascading effect within the city and within the culture of the city. So I just wanted to point out that aspect of it because you need to have a, a s sort of a sense of how to translate, share, exchange all that knowledge and do it in a politically feasible, realistic way. So I guess I don't really have a question if you want to maybe talk to <laughs> about that aspect of policy and governance and how the initiative will handle that. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, for that and actually, I hadn't really, uh, that's good history because I didn't know that these positions were initially funded from ASU. But I was, in my thinking about it, I was thinking, you know, we need to get to a place where we have equity. You know, we want everyone to be thinking about equity. But we need to also, it's not going to happen by itself. So we need some people with dedicated time and resources to be thinking about it in, in our institutions that are making policy decisions. So I think that that is a wonderful point. And maybe I would actually follow up. Oh, yeah, CJ, go ahead. 
Can I just add a couple things? Lauren, thanks for mentioning that. And I didn't realize that ASU started out funding that. I think that's really wonderful. And I know that there are other national foundations that a few years ago were investing in similar positions around resiliency. So I believe it, um, in New Orleans, the CERDNA Foundation um, funded for a couple of years a chief resiliency officer. So that, I think that's a really interesting idea. How we approach, um, we approach influencing um, government structures in a couple of different ways. Uh, currently, we are, along with LISC, who's here today, and the Phoenix IDA, we are funding um, some staff training, which hopefully all of the, all of the city uh, council members within the city of Phoenix will be attending GARE training, which is government and I can't remember what the A stands for, racial equity. And it's, it's about understanding the history of racial equity and how to apply that to the current work. We're doing that training with the hopes that that will in turn change the, the decision making process. Similarly, within the, the city of, of Tempe, again, thanks to, to Braden, and I give him a lot of credit, he very quickly saw who was showing up to sustainability conversations. And they were not the po folks who were most impacted by climate change. They were folks who, who looked a lot like me. And uh, he said, this isn't, this isn't gonna lead to policy change that's going to improve the quality of life for those in most impacted. So we've been working with the city of Tempe, again funded thankfully t um, through the, the city council and a little bit with our funding. Uh, we're funding uh, what's called Tempe Ec Equity in Action. And we're taking, they're taking a, a look at a couple of smaller uh, citizen councils and how they can bring organizations that represent the lived experience, who have firsthand knowledge of lived experience, into those conversations. And it's a very, it's very intentional. Um, it's probably going to be modeled after some work in uh, Portland and uh, the city of Seattle. What I think is also really important about that is also there, there will be a compensation associated with the participation of these organizations. So I think that's particularly important as folks in academia and, and, and foundations, we assume folks are gonna come to meetings and share their lives with us, and then they're gonna go home and that's good enough. Um, but we fail to recognize the true value of that. And so by at least acknowledging in some way the importance of that knowledge and the uniqueness of that knowledge that they bring to the table, I think is moving in a, in a huge direction. Um, I anticipate seeing more of that, I hope, um, going forward, because as we and as ASU, as cities, as communities, as governments, go out and ask folks, oh, do you live in a food desert? How, you know, what do you do to get food? What do you want ha to happen in your community? After about the 10th time, people get kind of ticked off, rightly so. Um, and they've been asked for the over and over the same thing again. So how can we more respectfully, more humbly, uh, acknowledge the lived experience and the value that that brings to the table in policy discussions? Yeah, so just to, to add to that, I think that actually that point is really important and that's something that in looking at all of these different resilience plans and other city plans we're finding is that there's often a lot of discussion about public engagement, uh, public consultation, but they off and they'll say, oh, it's important to, you know, to engage with, with minority populations, with, uh, you know, the, all the community, but they don't really specifically discuss how they're actually going to do that. And I think it is very challenging. It's not sufficient to just have a public meeting and expect people to show up. Um, and I think there, are, you know, there's people who have studied this and, and tried to look at how you can actually make sure that you do meaningfully engage with, uh, you know, with with populations that don't normally show up to public meetings and that don't look like us uh, here, right? Um, and so I think that's really important. Um, I also thought just one other point. So getting at this idea of the resilience officers, um, actually, the city of Boston um, to give them another. Uh, to mention them again, they actually have their chief resilience officer uh, and their resilience office is an office of racial equity. Um, and so their, their CRO is specifically focused on equity and they have separated that from, for instance, their climate office, uh, which is 
which has a different head and so I think that's actually a really interesting model and there's a few other cities that are also sort of thinking about actually having chief sort of equity officers in a way um, I don't know that they're calling them that um, but but actually having equity offices and I think that's something that maybe uh, we need to be watching and looking at and, and learning from and I think that's another point too is that um, having people like Braden um, in Tempe I know he is working networking and a lot of these these chief sustainability officers resilience officers are part of of networks um, with other sort of uh, similar people in different positions and they're learning a lot from each other um, and so I think that's really important as well and, and we as researchers I think can actually help them um, in in sort of learning from other cases documenting those experiences um, and sharing that so for instance we're working uh, on a project where we actually looked at how cities were institutionalizing resilience and we did that for uh, the city of Portland's chief sustainability officer um, because that was something that she was interested in how cities were doing that so I think that's an example where you can actually uh, help help facilitate these kinds of governance conversations too as a researcher this is fascinating conversation. I, I have two thoughts. One is more of a conceptual and one is a more of a practical kind of level. And on the conceptual level, I just want to make sure and I, I, that we're also talking about resilience and equity uh, in a way that we don't reify the people who are experiencing inequities as being not resilient because some of the most resilient people that I know are experiencing extreme inequities. So um, we need to be very careful also how we talk about it and um, I'm saying this to myself as well that we are always cognizant of that and one of the ways I think that we can ensure against those kinds of thought traps is in a practical level really deeply engaging with the communities um, that, that we're talking about but you know th here we get in this conundrum asking people to continually answer questions it's just a, you know we need to be more aware of what has gone on before what has other ASU people done what you know what is going on in these communities and there is a really uh, wonderful resource out of the um, President's Office of Initiatives, uh, Lindsay Beagley, who runs the uh, community engagement. She has an incredible database of things that have happened. So uh, we love it so much at the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience. As soon as she's off of maternity leave, we are trying to acquire part of her <laughs> because it's, it's super useful and also add value in the terms of, of spatializing her database about where. Where are people working because that's how we think so that we can find that stuff easier. And another sort of practical um, win solution that I have been seeking to do for many, many years, including at Texas Tech, that I really couldn't get a lot of traction with, um, but finally I kind of got a little grain of, of, of permission for, is that besides those um, money resources, we have all around us this incredible human resources called ASU students who are all throughout the community. The challenge is, you want to work in a particular place, then how do you know where the ASU students are that might be from that place? I keep trying to do this, but I, got, I made a little inroads because we did this work in the Edison East Lakes area and, uh, with the Nature Conservancy and David Hondula and, and this group about heat resilience. And I said, I want to know who are the students, ASU students who live in that neighborhood. You, we're gonna, you guys are going to go do this data collection. We need to have those students informed, participating, helping us, uh, and I didn't get very far, but I got, I got and, and people told me, oh, we don't have students living there. They can't afford to go to university, probably we don't. There were 200 students in that zip code. And I wasn't able to get their names, but I was able to get a message to them about our project. And now I'm working on a systematic way so that we can reach our students where we're working and reach the students who live there and from there and invite them to be a part of that. We've, we're on a topic that I am very passionate about. I think especially when we're talking about equity, I think the leading indicator of how a community is equitable is how the, um, the governments communicate and interact with their residents. I think you ask folks, um, how, how is your community interacting? How is your city government interacting with you? Is it respectful? Is it responsive? And I think that is a huge leading indicator of, of how equitable a place is. I'll, I'll, I'll use this as an example. So South, the, the whole discussion around South Phoenix um, and the light rail. 
we had heard about four years ago from residents who lived in South Phoenix that they didn't trust the process, they didn't feel included in the process of planning for the light rail. Um, many of them were undocumented, so going to a meeting sponsored by Valley Metro or the City of Phoenix was not comfortable for them. Um, they were not engaging them in ways that was in a meaningful way for them. So what we did was we went out and we interviewed a whole host of folks who live in, in South Phoenix and said, A, so the light rail's coming to your neighborhood. Do you want to be involved in some of the decisions around that, such as, you know, the shade trees, how the, how the stops are designed, whatnot, all of the urban planning questions that often go with these things. And you know, everyone we asked said, yes, we want to be involved. We know this is a big deal. We know this is going to influence our lives. Then the question was, the current structure of how the city and Valley Metro is engaging you, do you feel comfortable with that? Do you want to go to those meetings? And you know, you know, uniformly, uh, folks said no. So then the next question was, well, how and in what way do you want to be engaged? Which is a pretty simple question. I mean, it's like a marketing question, and I'm not a marketing person, but it's like, how do you, how do you want to be engaged? You know, it, and that's a, it's a simple question, but it means so much. And so what we heard, we heard a number of barriers that came up over and over. Trust was huge, um, especially among communities of color who had been there for many years, especially folks who had been part of the Golden Gate community who were pushed out. Um, trust was a huge issue. The whole issue of, I've told these people the same thing over and over, and A, I don't hear back, and B, nothing changes. That came up over and over. So what we did was we took the themes that we heard from respondents, went out and looked at other cities in the US, and how they calibrated their community engagement tactics to, pr to address these particular things such as trust, such as not hearing back from them. And you end up with this really interesting matrix of ideas that are beyond the normal bag of tricks that cities bring to community engagement. And I realize that for many cities, it's very uncomfortable to go beyond the 7 p.m. on a Tuesday night meeting um, at the local school. But I think in order to reach equity, and in, in, in order to so address all of those issues up there, we need to have a different, com we, need to f we need to figure out how to have a different conversation with the people who are not doing well. And the current way that we're doing it is not working. So we probably have time for one, one last question or comment. Okay. Uh, my name is Vicki Anderson. I am uh, the third group uh, of, of non-related uh, urban planners or ASU students. I am, uh, just found out I was gonna die at 71. I live in 85004, and I was just told by the gentleman beside me that I should move to the 85 here. So that part of the conversation is really interesting. Um, so uh, being in architecture, for years and studying uh, in 2001, I, I would ask the question of urban planners, are you at a point that you are identifying a problem? Are you now at a point to say, maybe we are part of the problem? That maybe urban planning created some of these inequities a long time ago? That maybe organically grown cities should be looked at versus planned cities of arranged arrangement? Um, one, I think that question has to be looked at, as well as with architecture. I mean, I'm part of the problem too. But I do know that in working with cities and developing, planning and zoning, there is no rational way of thinking there. It's all programmatic. It's all in a book. We can't have a conversation about reuse. And I was doing reuse downtown Phoenix in 2005. There was no common, we couldn't even talk about reusing a building for anything other than what it was zoned for. And if you didn't, you had to go through a variance process. I remember doing one for a, a small, like 3,000 square foot building. We had 14 variances, mostly because of parking or a bathroom situation. I mean, we've got to look at this at the planning start. Okay, so I chose to live in 04 in 2006. I chose to live there. I live in the flight path. 
again, chose to live there. Um, interesting thing happened, they changed the flight path. It was great, great. Guess what? It changed back. You know why? Because the wealthier parts of town went together and sued. Now, did we, we and I'm pretty involved, I'm pretty involved, and I've been involved in the light rail from day one, 2012, so we can talk about that process too. Um, we did not know that we had an opportunity to voice our concerns in my 04 neighborhood until it, it was already closed. And then they sued and got what they wanted. And guess what? Now it's back to the same. But people in their neighborhood say to me, you chose that. It can't change, right? It can't be equitable for everyone that those flight paths get expanded and get pushed to the other parts of the city because I chose to live there. So because I chose it, it's right for them. I've been on the light rail since 2012. I have been taking my daughter to these meetings since she was five. All I heard when we started was better, we could do better bus systems. We could do a um, streetcar or a light rail. And guess what I heard at all those meetings? I heard people of South Phoenix saying it's inequitable if they don't get light rail. They wouldn't even talk about anything else. We couldn't talk about a streetcar option. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. I love public transportation. I think it's worth it. I think it needs to go down there. And guess what the city said every time? If we're gonna do light rail, we're not changing the lane structure. That was from day one, day one. Years go on, gets voted in by the taxpayers, we end up at City Hall, you know, going through this process. So I would agree that maybe the process was inequitable, but I will say the conversation was from the people who lived there at the time, if we don't get the same as this other part of town, it's not equitable. We couldn't even have a conversation. So how, <laughs> it's really confusing as a, as, as, as a, you know, person who lives there to go through this process and how to make it equitable? It's an interesting question. Um, I don't know really where I'm going with this other than um, I think it starts uh, with education. I think it comes out of, out of schools, people get into these jobs, they get into the public sector, and, and you really need to constantly question the policies uh, that planners are putting in place. Um, and then, I don't know, maybe I, you know, I think it's valuable to live downtown, and I'm, I'm going to tell people why, because everybody asks me, aren't you afraid to live down there? And I always say no, because people stealing things, they're not stealing from me. <laughs> people causing problems, they're not stealing, they're coming to your neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> I know all my neighbors, I've been actively involved with my community for years, and I've seen it, it uh, change, and I've seen it not change. And we have a vast amount of vacant lots, vast. Um, and it's still the same complaining from the people that have been there from day one. So you have to, I think, get more people in these areas to help make change. Because if you don't live in those areas, you're not going to be able to change them. All the questions I would get, Oh my gosh, it's, it's really insulting. And I'm pretty much not the minority, I'm a minority, but not, oh. <laughs> anyway. It, it, it's been an interesting struggle to be the, the, I've been known as the white lady that lives across the park, which is fine, that's fine, they know me. But other white people coming in asking these questions is pretty insulting. And lots of volunteers, mostly all white, no offense to anybody. Again, coming to make it better for, for, for us. It's really hard to take, really hard to take. So those things need to be adjusted, and I believe you're, you're working on that, but um, it, it does take a, a long view. And believe me, I'm still an outsider, and I've lived there 12 plus years. 
and I'm still considered an outsider. So, thank you so much for that perspective. And we, I think actually that's a wonderful way to end the conversation with a bit of a reality check about the work that we do and the impact that we're having and the perspectives that we need to take. So I'm really grateful for those comments and that you're here today. So we are out of time. We do have the room a little longer, I believe, so you can mingle and continue the conversation. But thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you so much to our audience. And have a great day and go forth being fair-minded in your thought process today. <laughs>